Seven long years ago, a youngster in California vanished. Everyone thought he was dead at this point. Away for seven years, and a lot of people still wonder why you didn't try to escape before you finally did escape three years mm -hmm. ago. When you look back on that, why do you think that is, Stephen? Well, there's, there's several reasons. I was told I was adopted. You believed it? Yes, I believed it. Everyone enjoys a good mystery. We devour true crime stories that allow us to peer into the darkness from the comfort of our homes. But when that darkness encroaches into our own lives, no one is spared. The Stainer family experienced this firsthand. Their story defies belief, featuring astonishing highs and unimaginable lows. It begins in the quiet farming community of Merced, California, where seven-year-old Stephen Stainer vanished without a trace on his walk home from school. Despite a massive search, he remained missing for over seven agonizing years. His family never lost hope, even as the holidays came and went with his seat at the table painfully empty. Little did they know, young Stephen was being held captive just miles away by a manipulative port. Against all odds, the boy managed to escape and save another captive in a daring act of heroism. The miraculous homecoming was splashed across newspapers nationwide, hailed as a triumph of the human spirit. But the family's nightmare was far from over. In a tragic turn, Stephen's life was cut short at age 24 by a hit-and-run driver. Then the unthinkable occurred. His own brother was convicted of brutally ending four women near Yosemite National Park. How could one family suffer such extremes of trauma and grief? Their unfathomable story raises profound questions about good and evil, innocence and guilt, fate and circumstance. As we delve into the chilling twists and turns, remember that reality is always stranger than fiction. And even in darkness, there is light. It just takes the right guide to find it. This is the story of the Stainers. Hello guys, and welcome back to Crimeco where we break down some of the most chilling true crime cases from every corner of the globe, providing you with the most recent and in-depth information. If this sparks your interest, we would be delighted if you could subscribe to the channel. Also, giving this video a like significantly supports the channel's growth. We appreciate your help. Now, grab a blanket to hide behind, and let's dive into today's interesting case. They didn't change that much. I, I recognized them when I got out of the car. What about your brothers and sisters? Uh, they changed a lot. I never recognized either one of them. The events of this shocking case unfolded in the lush farmlands of California's Central Valley. Merced County, located roughly halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, was a quiet rural community in 1972. Residents enjoyed the slow pace of life, though some shook their heads at the rapidly changing times. Traditional values still held sway, with church and family at the center of daily life. It was here that the Stainer family put down roots. Delbert and Kay Stainer married in 1959 and soon started their family. Eldest son Carrie was born in 1961, followed by Stephen in 1965. Three daughters completed the sibling group, Tammy, Colleen, and Corey. By all accounts, they were a typical American family making an honest living in America's heartland. On December 4, 1972, the Stainers experienced every parent's worst fear. Seven-year-old Stephen didn't return home after school. Law enforcement launched a massive search, scouring fields and canvassing neighbors for any sign of the boy. But he had simply vanished without a trace. Only his backpack was recovered, its contents scattered along the roadside. As days turned to weeks and months, the Stainers refused to give up hope. Stephen's seat at the dinner table remained set, presents carefully tucked away for the day he would return. But that moment seemed less likely with each passing Christmas. Little did they know, Stephen was being held captive just a short distance away, unaware of his family still longed for his safe return. The details of his terrible ordeal would not emerge for years, but now, the story shifts to a P-word whose manipulation and deceit shattered a little boy's life. 
we warn that the content ahead contains descriptions of the award. If you need support, help is available through the National SA Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Kenneth Parnell was a drifter with a dark past. Born in 1931, he spent much of his childhood shuffled between foster homes after being removed from his negligent parents. By 1951, his criminal record began with a conviction for child and word, which landed him in St. Quentin State Prison. After his release, Parnell kidnapped an eight-year-old boy in Berkeley in the 1950s, but was caught soon after. He served just two years before being paroled, then drifted into robbery, which earned him more prison time. This deeply disturbed man was free again by 1972. Parnell conspired with a credulous accomplice named Irvin Murphy to take away a young boy he could raise. On December 4th, they set their sinister plot in motion. Murphy approached Stephen after school under the guise of soliciting church donations. He lured the child into a waiting car where Parnell whisked him away to a remote cabin. Thus began seven years of horrific a word and manipulation at Parnell's hands. Threatened into silence, Stephen was beaten, touched without permissions, and brainwashed into believing he was unwanted by his own family. Parnell renamed him Dennis and posed as his father, uprooting frequently to avoid discovery. But if you look in the background, there's, there's something worth noting, and it's Carrie in his baseball cap, and he's not smiling at all. The captive boy retreated deeply into this assumed identity, his memories of home receiving. Remarkably, even as the years passed, Stephen never tried to escape. His spirit had been broken by Parnell's cruelty. But a tiny flicker of his humanity remained, soon to be reignited by a new captive. By 1980, seven grueling years had passed since Stephen's abduction. Now 14, he was growing resistant to Parnell's advances. Undeterred, the P-word set his sights on new prey, an innocent five-year-old named Timothy White. On February 14, Parnell manipulated a teenager named Sean Porman into helping procure the boy. Porman lured young Timmy into a car outside his school in Ukea, 200 miles from Merced. Parnell quickly dyed Timmy's blonde hair black and began reenacting the same brainwashing rituals on him. But this time, something in Stephen snapped. He saw himself in this helpless child and found the courage he had lost long ago. After 16 days of Timmy's torment, Stephen decided enough was enough. On March 1, 1980, while Parnell was away, Stephen seized the chance. He gathered up Timmy and a few supplies, then hitched a harrowing ride to the Ukea police station. In the early hours of March 2nd, he walked through the doors with Timmy in his arms. Though initially reluctant to reveal details, he ultimately told officers, I know my first name is Stephen. After over seven years missing, with all hope lost, Stephen Stainer had been found against all odds. His incredible escape was only the beginning of the Stainer family's unbelievable story. Stephen Stainer's miraculous return home sparked jubilant headlines nationwide. After over seven agonizing years missing, the Stainer family's prayers had been answered. But they quickly realized the laughing, carefree boy who left had been forever changed. Stephen was overwhelmed adjusting to normal life with his family. The little child they remembered was now a teenager, struggling to reconnect with parents and siblings who were virtual strangers. Well-meaning media attention and limelight only compounded his trauma. He had no counseling to process the years of horrific a word. Stephen described feeling lost and conflicted, even regretting his decision to escape at times. He turned to alcohol and using to cope with vivid flashbacks and nightmares, at school, he was mercilessly picked on when details of his SA emerged. Dropping out, he held down odd jobs and clung to the drink. But by 1985, there were hopeful signs the resilient young man might conquer his demons. Now 20, 
Stephen reconnected with high school acquaintance Jody Edmondson. Their relationship blossomed into marriage and, starting a family, their daughter Ashley was born in 1986, followed by son Stephen Jr. in 1987. For the first time since childhood, Stephen seemed truly happy. He was described as a doting father who finally had the chance to heal old wounds, but fate had harsher plans in store. After enduring seven years of unfathomable hardship, Stephen Stainer's life was cut tragically short. On September 16, 1989, the 24-year-old was riding home from work on his motorcycle. At an intersection, a car turned in front of him. Stephen was hurled from his bike and suffered fatal head trauma. The driver fled but was later identified as Anthony Laura. He received just 90 days in jail for the devastating hit and run. Stephen left behind his utterly devastated wife Jody and their two young children, ages three and two. His funeral drew hundreds mourning the loss of a man who had survived so much, only to have his life ripped away needlessly. The tragic twist was a cruel final blow for the Stainer family, now forever missing both a beloved son and brother. But impossibly, their suffering did not end there. After Stephen's tragic death, the media spotlight shifted to examine his childhood, taking away and rescue. The 1989 NBC miniseries, I Know My First Name Is Stephen, brought the case back into headlines. While popular, the TV movie did take some creative liberties distressing for the family. Most significantly, it depicted Stephen's trauma as inspiring jealousy in older brother Carrie. But by all accounts, the quiet boy avoided the limelight after Stephen's return. Oh, you know, my first name is Stephen. I think my last name is Dana. Their father, Dell, pushed Stephen into the public eye, protesting counseling would show weakness. This further isolated Carrie as the forgotten child. Dell devoted himself tirelessly to the search before Stephen's escape. But after, he withdrew emotionally, bellowing at or ignoring Carrie. The boy coped by compulsively pulling out his hair until balding. As a teen, Carrie turned inward, showing talent for art, but unable to relate to girls. He later backpacked alone for months, becoming a with true crime cases. His social awkwardness deepened into unsettling behavior like stalking women. In his 20s, Kerry lived in isolation outside Yosemite National Park where he worked. His inner demons, long repressed, were stoked by bad obsessions. In 1999, Kerry was arrested for the brutal ending of four women near Yosemite. The heinous crimes shocked the nation reviving interest in the Stainer family's past trauma. Carrie's motives remain murky, but evidence suggests a dissociative madness had lurked within him since childhood, a sickness ignored too long. The 1999 Yosemite endings vaulted the Stainer family back into the media vortex, now centered on brother Carrie. During his sensational trial, the shy man reveled in the attention, behaving around and offering deranged interviews against his lawyer's orders. Kerry displayed overt signs of mental illness, claiming to hear voices and obsessing over fantasies of bad things against women. But prosecutors rejected insanity, arguing he was fully in control of his actions. They painted him as a cunning psychopath who willfully gave in to evil compulsions. Both interpretations contained truth, Evidence shows Carrie Stainer endured immense childhood trauma exacerbated by neglect. His resulting sickness festered without care, metastasizing into horrific actions. Yet he also consciously embraced darkness, defying intervention until it was too late. The case defies simplistic explanations. Carrie is neither wholly culpable nor blameless for the extremes of his madness. 
Perhaps in a better world, help could have pulled him back from the brink. But now, redemption remains elusive. Carey was convicted on four counts of M in the first degree and sentenced to death. He resides on death row at San Quentin State Prison, though California's moratorium on executions spares him indefinitely. The Stainer family was left questioning how they could endure such unfathomable misfortune. Stephen Stainer's daughter Ashley now tells their story, highlighting media misconceptions. She hopes to shift focus back to celebrating her father's inspiring courage and sacrifice. His bold escape provided hope when all seemed lost. That singular act of heroism remains Stephen Stainer's lasting legacy. The harrowing saga of the Stainer family defies easy explanation or narrative. Their unfathomable tragedies resist reduction to pat television tropes. Steven Stainer's taking and courageous escape is not a feel-good made-for-TV movie with a tidy ending. Nor can Brother Carey's mental disintegration be pinned on jealousy over Steven's publicity. Their stories intertwine in complex, irreconcilable ways. Perhaps the closest we come to truth is by honoring the full humanity of each man. Steven Stainer was an innocent child warped by forces beyond his control who found hope and heroism in helping another. His life was far too brief, but his courage and sacrifice remind us that light still flickers even in the deepest darkness. His memory lives on through those he rescued and inspired, and his story stands as a testament to the resilience of human goodness against unimaginable evil. Carrie Stainer was a troubled soul neglected when he needed help most. His sickness grew untended for decades before erupting in rage. Both lives were tragically cut short, one redeemed by courage, the other consumed by darkness. Their loved ones deserve privacy and peace after enduring such extremes of anguish. Yet still, the Stainers permit their story to be told, trusting it brings hope to others suffering unimaginable burdens. No simple lessons exist here, only quiet awe at the fragility of life's fate has led far astray, and remembering that even when shadows close in, light endures if we candle its flame. Before you leave, please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell. This will ensure you stay informed about the latest true crime cases we uncover. We're grateful to have you as part of our community as we explore the captivating mysteries that continue to fascinate us all. Stay curious and vigilant that even closed books still hold untold pages waiting patient revelation. Thank you for joining us, and we eagerly anticipate seeing you in our next exploration. Until next time.